Do we have everyone on, Audrey? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, then let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amber Molina, your BOMA San Diego president, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, and welcome to our August virtual BOMA meeting. I'd like to extend a special thank you to our programs and seminars committee for arranging this virtual event. Just a friendly reminder to please put your audio on mute for the benefit of our attendees. And if you have any questions during the program, Please feel free to use the chat feature and we'll address your questions during the Q&A portion of the programming. I'd like to also extend a big thank you to everyone for joining us today, as I know most of you may be working from home, and we appreciate your continued BOMA involvement and support. Our goal during this time is to continue the BOMA mission and maintain our usual programming with virtual events. We thank you for being flexible and encourage you to stay apprised of BOMA news and information, especially now as BOMA has its finger on the pulse of all industry relevant information as it pertains to our local mandates, including state and federal guidelines. Please visit the BOMA San Diego website if you haven't done so already and stay on top of this important information. As we carry on in the year with our theme, Your Future in Focus, I'd like to highlight that today's guest speakers and topic are incredibly important to our future as COVID-19 and the long-term effects from this pandemic may have some lasting impact into our future. So I'm glad that we'll be providing you with the knowledge and best practices and the reoccupancy resources that we all require during this unprecedented time. With that said, I very much look forward to hearing from our guest speakers today. And now we'd like to give a small moment of gratitude to our incredible sponsors, in order to make these events happen in the new virtual normal, we count on their generous support. On behalf of BOMA San Diego, I want to extend a sincere thank you to our August annual supporting partners. Our platinum sponsor, Brightview. Our gold sponsors, ABM and ASAP Drain Guys and Plumbing. Our energy sponsor, SDG&E. Our silver sponsors, ATI, CCS Facility Services, CNI Roofing, Cox Business, and Dowling Construction. Please be sure and support our annual supporting partners, and you can find their information on the directory on the sponsor page in our website at bomasd.org. Now I'd like to turn it over to our platinum sponsor, Brian Maynard, with Brightview for a brief presentation. Perfect, thank you, Amber. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Maynard, and I'm the regional key account manager for Brightview here in Southern California. On behalf of David Howell, our VP GM, and Lexi Green from our sales team, and Ryan Dooley from our Brightview Tree team, I want to thank everybody for joining in this webinar today, and I'm, we're going to show you a quick video. Sorry guys, I just 
got all the messages that there was no audio on there the whole time. So I hope you all enjoy this again. Yes, let's hear it again. Is there audio? Thanks. Yes. Yes, but no picture. Ready? Ready. There's a feeling that's hard to describe. Right here. The feeling when everything falls into place. We're here. The realization of all you'd envisioned. So much in life and business is finite, but your success is not. Nor are the memories of those who enjoy the most. At Brightfield, we can be in the environment that defines the problem. Memorable moments and meaningful connections in it. For every first impression, every big moment, every big deal, and every goodbye. We're here. We're here when things go wrong, and we're here when things need to be just right. Giving you confidence in a service that makes you feel cared for. Consistency that builds your trust. A world of resources at your fingertips. And a focus like you're the only one in the world. You see, at Brightview, we're passionate about nurturing your landscape. But the real reward is seeing how it benefits you. From water management, to tree care, enhancements, and beyond. We offer more than just landscape solutions. We deliver peace of mind by restoring safety, preserving the environment, and operating with the highest standards of corporate and social responsibility. Whenever you need us, wherever you need us, with locations across the country, and right here in your backyard. A partner you can count on to maintain your biggest moments and all the little ones in between. Because it's not just the first impression that matters, it's every impression. Brightview, we're here. Hey, thank you. Thank you for sharing that video with us, Brian. Sorry about the technical difficulties there early on. And now we'd like to share a short video from our gold sponsor, ABM. Thank you, ABM. And now we'd like to present a short video from our gold sponsor, ASAP Drain Guys and Plumbing. Thanks to all our sponsors for sharing those videos with us. It's certainly still important to keep um, their services top of mind and important to remember what they do for us. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Elvira. Uh, as most longtime BOMA members are aware, we support the annual backpack drive benefiting promises to kids every summer. And this year will certainly be no exception to that. Here to tell you a little bit more about this amazing nonprofit organization is Elvira Ocampo. Elvira, take it away. 
Yeah, so this year's BOMA Back to School Thrive is benefiting Promises to Kids, a local nonprofit organization which helps support the educational needs of 3,000 foster kids throughout San Diego. Uh, because of your generosity, BOMA has raised over $11,600 um, today. We set our goal to $15,000, but there is still time to contribute if you can. Um, the drive ends in two weeks, which will be August 25th. Uh, and one of the recipients of uh, Promises to Kids her name is Susie, um, has sent us a video to share her story and how Promises to Kids has positively impacted her life. Uh, and you'll want to turn up the volume for this video. I've been sitting at Denny the State University studying community and advocate for indigenous people, soon to be working in the borough of Indian Affairs. Growing up, I did not have a mom. Growing up, I had situations with people that I never wanted to be like. Before I entered Promises to Kids, I worked three jobs, provided all my living expenses all by myself. Your generosity has given me the opportunity to participate in the program through this borough. Within this program, I was able to find my voice and give back to my community by speaking up for former foster youth who don't have a voice. I was granted the opportunity to be an advocate for foster youth at the Pulaski Children's Center here in San Diego. I'm eternally grateful for this opportunity because I'm able to give back to our community at the same time as well as help them. I'm able to provide my story of resilience and my support in showing that if I, someone who was once in the system, someone who was once in their shoes, and if I made it out, so can they. I'm able to show and tell them all of the resources that, that they too can partake in everything that I've been doing. Within this program, I was able to find my voice and give back to my community by speaking up for former foster youth who don't have a voice. Working at Polinsky Children's Center as youth to youth, I come in contact with dozens and dozens of youth every single day. Uh, one particular youth, she came across me as a high school senior. And she reminded me of myself because I was very hardworking, very focused, very resilient. And she was exactly that. She asked me if I could help her contact her social worker so that she could partake in extracurricular activities at her school. And I was more than happy to. Uh, I contacted the social worker. Uh, I requested that whatever she wanted to do was done. And I was honestly able to do everything that I said. And because of this job, because of this role, because of people like you at Bowman and Gail, I was given this opportunity to help our foster youth. If it wasn't for this role, I wouldn't have been able to help that young girl. I would not be in this position if it wasn't for people like you and promises to kids. I'm eternally grateful for all the support that I've been given. Because of you, I now have a mentor who I call family. Michelle Zamora, who I have the privilege of calling my mentor, has been nothing but a blessing in my life. She has offered so much support academically wise, financially wise, and just moral support in every topic that I can imagine. One day, Michelle and I sat down and we had a conversation about my career goals. Um, Originally, I've always wanted to work with Indigenous people amongst our communities, giving back, uh, giving back and just showing, showing up for our people. And one day she asked me, is that all I wanted to do? And she asked me if I wanted to explore my options. And honestly, before that, I never really thought about exploring my options. So what she mentioned that I was kind of intrigued. I wanted to reach out, I wanted to explore. And that's what we did. We talked about what if I wanted to go into marketing? What if I wanted to go back into law? What if I wanted to go and be a, an agent of some sort? And she really just got me going and I couldn't be more grateful. Like my career options have expanded greatly because of her. And if it wasn't for BOMA, I wouldn't have, if it wasn't for BOMA San Diego, I wouldn't have Michelle in my life to support me on making decisions to explore my career options. Another amazing program that I am so eager to participate is the Women's Leadership. This program focuses on helping young women find their career. It helps us reach our goals by creating numerous connections within our community and outside of our community. We are able to make these connections and have them for life. This new to go on live radio. I've been published in multiple articles, online and newspaper. 
Thank you to everyone at BOMA San Diego for their unconditional support. Ambriosity has not only helped me, but it has helped so many other foster youth to be successful and be in the same position as I am today. It has given us countless opportunities to enhance our careers, to enhance our goals, and to be more successful than ever. Thank you all for being here today, and thank you for listening to my story. All right, so thank you again, um, everyone, for all your generosity. And I'm going to pass it back to Amber. Great. Thank you, Elvira. And I mean, I just love that you shared that video with us. There's no better way than showing what we do for people and all the hard work just to see where it goes to and how it benefits so many youth in San Diego. So, so great to see that. All right. Well, moving along. Okay, with such important issues facing us today, it is critical that BOMA San Diego stays on the forefront on issues of relevance and critical importance to the commercial real estate industry. Craig Benedetto, our local legislative advocate, plays a vital role in keeping us informed as he keeps our membership apprised on the significant impacts that government actions and legislation have on our industry. Here to provide you an update on all government actions related to COVID mandates and so much more, please welcome Craig Benedetto. Hello, everybody. I wish I was in front of you at lunch, but we all know that's not allowed. Uh, we don't want anybody giving COVID to each other. Um, so as you know, the state uh, has had a bit of an issue reporting positive COVID tests, and that obviously relates back to us in a county that is on the watch list as to whether or not we can get off the watch list and get some of our businesses that are now reclosed back open again. Uh, according to the governor yesterday, uh, they have gotten rid of the state's public health director and now have fixed the problem. Um, they apparently, according to at least one mayor, the mayor of Los Angeles, have had this issue for a number of months now. So it's really unclear, you know, how many positives are truly out there. But I did have a conversation this morning with one of our members of the Board of Supervisors who believes that the County of San Diego's numbers aren't going to change appreciably when they add in uh, the several thousand numbers of positives and tests into the system. That said, we will still likely be uh, exceeding the trigger to be on the watch list, that being 100 positive tests for 100,000 people. And we also currently still exceed the number of community outbreaks in the County of San Diego. So as a result, that means that non-essential businesses, uh, and most of our members, I should note, fall into the category of essential businesses, but many of your tenants do not. Um, you're, if you're not an essential business, uh, your official place of business is to, supposedly to be closed, and your employees should be working remotely. Um, it's unclear when the county might come off that watch list, uh, and we'll obviously keep you posted on that. Uh, when those public health orders might change. Uh, we are hoping soon, and like I said, when I spoke with the supervisor this morning, they felt like it was trending in the right direction. There are some new mandates that the county has come out with uh, as, a as a result of some of this. Uh, it used to be that if you were uh, tested positive, the entity that tested you would report that back to the county. Uh, now there are some business requirements, and so if there is a community outbreak uh, uh, defined at your location. Under that new order, the business now is required to notify all employees and customers who are likely to have come in contact. You know, it's a, that's a difficult uh, thing to potentially do, and it's obviously very troubling for business, and we're continuing to work with the county on that. But it is something that is now mandated under the county's health order. Uh, in addition to that, the businesses are also required to inform the county of San Diego of positive tests if they are informed of and so if an employee does test positive and the business is informed of that, uh, that business is required to inform the County of San Diego. And so basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a handle on the contact tracing to try and nip in the bud if they can uh, these outbreaks so that they don't turn into a situation where we have super spreading going on and obviously a lot more COVID positives coming out because clearly uh, with the triggers tying back to what can be open and not open, it has a, a pretty direct impact on business in San Diego. So obviously on the return, this obviously gets back to return to work requirements. For those businesses that are allowed to be open, the county did change some of their requirements for returning to work. Um, at least 10 days have to have passed since the symptoms have began. Um, a limited number of people who have severe or critical Ill illnesses, um, have to wait an additional 10 days, so a total of 20 days. Um, so 
people, they're basically focusing this on the most vulnerable, the most compromised, uh, but ultimately they're not requiring a, a negative test to return back to work. So that's a positive development. Um, obviously we've all heard about and perhaps read in the media uh, or seen in the media, uh, the positivity rates or negativity rates and being unclear whether those tests are act actually accurate. So this does help. Um, this is the public health experts way of trying to get those who are truly sick uh, away from the workplace and those who are no longer sick back to work as soon as they possibly can. At the city of San Diego, part of uh, what the city has been doing is tied to your business. It has to do with rent repayment and evictions. Uh, the city of San Diego a few weeks ago did extend the eviction moratorium ordinance that applies to both commercial and residential properties in the city until September 30th of 2020. Uh, it's likely that they will revisit that again when they come back from their summer recess, which they are currently on. Uh, they also uh, took up and passed a rent repayment uh, ordinance, which allows for the timeline to pay back rent uh, under the terms of that eviction moratorium ordinance until December 31st of 2020. Uh, that was originally proposed to go to March 31st of 2020. Um, we were there expressing some concern about this as we have about the eviction moratorium ordinance and the impact on commercial property owners. Uh, they did pull it back uh, three months to get to the December 31st, 2020 period. It requires a second vote uh, as an ordinance. Uh, the original vote would have been an emergency measure, but that would have required six votes and there were only five votes in favor of it which does put a mayoral veto into play. Um, so when they pass the second reading of the ordinance, the mayor will then have a decision to make as to whether uh, he will veto it or not. We're in discussions both with the author's office being the council president, as well as the mayor's office on this, and we will keep you posted. At the state level, uh, Prop 15, you're gonna be hearing a lot about this. Uh, that is the split role initiative. Uh, we've talked a lot about split role over the last couple of years as we've known that this was going to be heading to the ballot. Well, now it has a ballot uh, designation as Prop 15. It also has a ballot summary prepared by our, uh, our state folks uh, through the Secretary of State. It basically is the uh, everything in apple pie for Californian statement. It basically says increases funding sources for public schools, community college and local government services by changing tax assessment of commercial industri and industrial property. Um, the ballot summaries are being challenged. We'll see what the courts end up saying. There was not a favorable hearing about this yesterday. Uh, we don't believe that this statement uh, encapsulate exactly what, encapsulates exactly what this does, uh, but this may be what we end up living with. And it just basically reinforces the point that funding our opposition campaign to split role is going to be critical. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about this in addition to what you've already heard a lot about. Um, and you're going to be asked for, and, and many other property owners around the state of California are going to be asked to help fund the opposition campaign. It's going to be a battle. We think we can win it, um, but it's obviously going to be a tough battle when you read things like the ballot summary. A bit of positive news, AB 939, which was a bill by Senator Scott Wiener out of San Francisco that would have mandated a year-long or longer repayment of rent under the COVID situation and the eviction moratorium ordinance, and allow for the tenant to cancel their lease without recourse if they don't like the terms for repayment offered by their landlord. Uh, that bill was killed in committee. It basically did not make it out of committee, which means it is dead, but kind of like a bad horror movie, nothing in Sacramento actually ever really dies. Uh, and there are no silver bullets or wooden stakes to, to finally put these things to rest. So we continue to monitor that in addition to a number of other bills that are working their way through their respective houses, the uh, state assembly and the state senate. Um, they need to get through by the end of the month. So we'll see how far a lot of these things get. So I think I've gotten to or, or perhaps exceeded my 10 minutes. So I'll stop there and just say thank you to all of you for continuing to engage uh, in these programs. Uh, when we have our calls to action, which we frequently do, they will go out separately and I just encourage you to keep involved because our elected officials need to hear from you and what you do. So thank you, Amber. Great, thank you, Craig. And I'm just gonna throw in a little plug. If anyone wants to join our government affairs committee to hear about these updates and much more information on a monthly basis, we have monthly committee meetings. Obviously they're virtual now. So if you would like to join, please feel free to email us and uh, we can get you on that invite. Okay, moving right along. Um, but before, 
I introduce our a special guest for today. I'd just like to provide another friendly reminder to please add your questions on the chat feature, um, and we will address them at the Q&A portion at the end. Our first speaker is Mary Flynn, the Vice President of People at CBRE. Mary has been with CBRE for 32 years and has dedicated to CBRE's property management line of business since 2009. Our second speaker is Grayson Gill. Grayson Gill is America's COO of property management at CBRE. Grayson has been in the property management business for 32 years, managing over 875 million square feet. Ladies and gentlemen, please extend a warm welcome to Mary Flynn and Grayson Gill. Take it away. Thank you, Amber. So, um, wanted to talk a little bit today to first put in perspective that today Grayson and I support a group of 5,000 plus property management professionals across the United States. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, as we try to get our arms around uh, COVID, it, this should, be, instead of being titled best practices, it should be called work in progress because we continue to be challenged daily on new things that come up that we need to um, work with our group to find answers for. So we'll talk a little bit about our lessons learned. Um, and so the first thing that we wanna talk about is the, is the communications. And I'm sure this has been a challenge for most of you as well. And when we started out at the beginning of this pandemic, um, we were trying to communicate to our team via our leaders in an email or a memo in writing. And uh, what we figured out real quick is that um, not everybody emails them. Yet. So, uh, and things were happening pretty fast and, um, and changing across multiple, I think we have about 50 markets across the United States and it seems that each market was in a different phase of COVID as we've gone along here. So, we've graduated to a toolkit that we put on our intranet site for our property manage managers and then we also have a live FAQ document that we now use to communicate to our employees on general questions about COVID and that's what we uh, actually update when things change. Uh, so things like when we started out, and I think when COVID first started in March, they were talking about three symptoms. And now I think you all know there are up to seven or eight uh, other symptoms that have been added to the list. And so what we learned quickly, especially in our written communications, is to put the link to the CDC and link it right to, so it's always up to date when to figure out what the symptoms are. So um, when we had things like um, the CBR makes a decision about a policy on mask, um, those things are when they're updated and because they're major changes, they'll be updated in the FAQ. We then also update a weekly newsletter that's sent out to all of property management employees. And um, in some cases we do extra communication. So in the mask situation that you all probably followed along went from not mandatory to optional to mandatory in most jurisdictions. Um, and then CBRE decided that our, you know, our uh, policy on the, on the mass situation would be uh, more conservative and it would be um, um, all the time that anybody was in motion at the site and only when they were, and, and, and they could remove it only when they were able to socially distance. So what we found out is that we put the communication out there and then we felt like we had some cases that um, indicated that when we went to, to, to do the close contact tracing that we found out that people weren't wearing their mask or they weren't uh, staying socially distant during the, day, during the day at the property. So we realized then that we needed to reinforce the message and then we took it local because people have a, tend to, have a tendency to uh, recognize and observe messages from their local leader so we went down and we actually um, added a key phrase, mask on the move. And uh, then some of our leaders had a little bit of a competitive um, issue on LinkedIn where they, they, they posted a picture. And again, any way that you can get creative that helps you get a message out because we know that our mess, our, our, uh, all of our employees are on email fatigue at this point and there's a lot of things that they're having to take in. Uh, during this ever-changing event every day. And so we feel like we've had to get a little creative with some of our messages, especially those that have changed and those are important to make sure that people are adhering to those important things. Um, one of the other things we learned along the way is that when um, best, some of our best information, you know, um, you'll see I've got um, a notification here that you can get it from the you know, San Diego government site and, and you guys have access to Craig. Um, but we definitely got most of our information from people on the ground. 
And when it's a state ordinance or a state order, uh, those were a little easier to follow. But when they started coming down to the county level, and then so many started coming out at a time, um, it began to get a little hard to keep up with. So uh, for instance, when the temperature check and people started coming back to work and that became uh, something we needed to focus on, we immediately got with our DNT group uh, to develop an application that we could roll out. And I think we started that in um, late April, early May. And in early May, we had a small, we had a situation come up where there was a small county in one of our markets that was requiring a temperature check daily. I think we found out on a Thursday, it was effective on Monday. And what we found out is we could go out to these sites and these, and these orders and look at the orders and this particular order like most actually had a sample document. So if you're not set up, uh, to instantly do uh, temperature checks on a, a, you know, and in 24 hours, like we were not. Um, they usually have great examples uh, that you can pull down and that you can put to use. Now we knew that we were going to need it for a broader use, and in a in a, in 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 a in, in a few few months, or this was going to start to be something that was going to be regularly rolled out across the U.S. Uh, but we decided just to bite off what we needed and get a document that our legal team was comfortable with. Uh, to put out a toolkit for our managers to manage this property um, for the, th through this process in this, in this individual uh, county. We had 15 people there, but it doesn't matter um, how large of a population you have, we had 15 people that needed this in 48 hours. So we pulled it together and then we started working and we didn't have all of the answers. So we pulled the team together and a lot of questions come up. So the question came up is like what, because uh, what we were asking because uh, what we wanted to find out is we wanted our employees to take their temperature before they got to work. So we said, take your temperature up to four hours of your start time be and, and then answer the questions about symptoms because we wanted to find out if people were sick before they got to the office. Because that was another thing we started seeing in some of our cases is that people would come to work and they would knowingly come in with symptoms. So we backed up our process and asked people to do this. And while we were working through it with this smaller you know, local team, the questions came up about what about a thermometer? What if somebody doesn't have a thermometer? What are we gonna do? And so I would caution you to, to know that when we rolled that out, that ended up being a very, very small issue. We haven't heard that a lot, that people don't have it. We did finally put in our FAQ that if somebody didn't have one and had to go buy, buy one that, uh, provided the cost was reasonable, we would reimburse them. But some of the things like that that seemed like a big issue that was stalling our rollout um, ended up something that we put on the back burner. We got to get this rolled out. We rolled it out and it ended up being a non-issue. So when you're rolling out things, I think it's a, you're, you're trying to feel like you've got a lot of people that have a lot of great questions that might come up. But I think at some point you got to draw the line. You got to you have to move forward and then you have to deal with it and tweak, tweak the thing as you go. So we rolled along and uh, we've rolled out, um, we, we got our app opened um, that our DNT group put together and we've rolled that out. Um, at CBRE, we have um, our property management is essential, uh, essential staff and then our GWS group has essential staff that's working at properties every day, but most of our corporate offices are closed. We have a handful that have reopened, but um, so the bulk of our employees are still working remotely. Uh, so we had a chance to pilot um, our app um, with just the smaller group of people that were essential and that, that was our property management group. So we got to work through the tweaks and we've advanced to the stage that the app allows um, the employee to send in their information. It comes back in the way of a memo, uh, I'm sorry, an email and they can show that email to any tenant when they go in that they, that they um, have passed the health screen for the day and are free to work. So uh, that's been um, successful. We're still working on the back end on how to get reporting out of it. So a manager that may need to tell um, all the tenants at a property that everybody at CBRE has passed their health screen test today. Um, we're still working through some, um, some of the uh, tweaks on that. But as I said, I think what's most important is to get started because every little bit that you do is somewhat helpful and helps people on the ground or at properties and managers at properties to communicate uh, as they need to communicate to uh, tenants and vendors and, and, and otherwise. Um, I think now, so we're, like I said, we're still working through it. We now have the travel restrictions. So we have some states and um, cities that have 
travel restrictions. And as we've gone through the summer vacation uh, piece, we've asked people that if they've traveled to any of these areas to give us a call when they return so we can let them know if um, they're allowed to go back to work or if where they traveled requires any sort of a quarantine. Uh, we did at the beginning of this have our people team staff doing the intake on these things and on each of these cases and communicating. Uh, we've now advanced to um, a central group that does it that we've slowly built over time. Um, and it seems like we are continuing to build our call center to, to do intake on COVID cases. Um, as more people go back to work, we're seeing an increase in, um, you know, in those cases. And so we are slowly uh, but surely adding staff to be able to cover um, to be able to cover that situation. So again, starts if you have to start small, start small. We graduate. We 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 did certain lines of businesses and moved them over to the call center one at a time. Um, but it's just important if you feel like you need a bigger need, start start where you can start and then just build build from there. Um, down to the uh, resources that are available, you know, uh, again, this live CDC link, again, getting people to look at it. I, you can, you got to be careful if you do a search on the internet, CDC, I did it today, and I, and what came up was something that was dated back in July. You want to make sure that you've got the most up-to-date CDC link, and if you're looking at the link, you need to make sure it has today's date on it. So you've got the most up-to-date information if you're trying to check something. There's a lot of, uh, like the San Diego website would be helpful to you. Um, and some of the things like around employees that are helpful for employees, if you, if, if you as a company have an employee assistance program, um, we've actually found um, some really great resources uh, that we just found out were available. We didn't, we didn't need them in the past, but this has certainly pushed us to need uh, additional resources to support our employees during, during this challenging time. And we actually found um, through them that they actually had a, um, a free access to a meditation app, um, access to tell people uh, within 10 mile, miles of a radius of their house where they can find daycare. So there's all kinds of things that if you pick up the phone and call your EAP provider, if you have one and ask them what they might have available, um, they have links and videos to help people through different difficult times. What we know is, um, you know, our, our employees have a, a little bit of balance to do when, when work is going well and they have challenge, something challenging going on at home. They can usually do the balance or vice versa, something difficult at work, but home is fine. But we know right now everybody's going through a really difficult time where both of those things are, are struggling. Uh, they're st struggling with work and then they can't go home to get away from it because we're all seeing the same thing at work and at home. So we are um, really pushing ourselves now at this point um, that we feel like we've got a lot of the question answers at the work site focusing on what can we do uh, better to help our employees through this um, through this stressful time. Um, the other thing person you may check with or people you may check with is your healthcare provider. Again, we've just found out that our healthcare provider had a, a CBRE, um, we have two different healthcare providers split for the United States. And we found out one of our providers has um, a, a, a great app that all of our employees can utilize, whether they're in the uh, in the healthcare plan or not. Either healthcare plan, every U.S. employee, they're making it available to them. So again, just calling and reaching out to people, you might find that you have some resources that are actually free right at your fingertips that you may not know about. So that's that's another thing we took advantage of. Uh, switching a little bit to our employee engagement during this time and how do you keep a remote workforce motivated um, in a time where people can't get together. We all know that part of, the, uh, part of what people come to work for is the social element and some of our essential workers um, are getting that to some extent, but they can't, they can't meet with all of the people that you're, they're used to working with at the workplace at this time um, because of workplace restrictions. So we've had to get creative about that. And of course, just like you're doing your MoMA call via Zoom, we have a lot of Zoom calls. Um, we, we've started out with teams like on, on the people team. Um, we, we had calls every day. Uh, we, then we went to three times a day. Uh, I'm sorry, we had, we had calls once a day. Uh, so five a week, then we went to three a week and now we're at one a week. But in order to keep that personal element, we do, we have added things like have everybody send, uh, you know, a uh, 
childhood picture of themselves to the organizer and then everybody can guess in the first five minutes of the call you know we do a two or three at a time or depending on how large your team is if that's a feasible idea but we've started doing those types of things what are your favorite house slippers what's your favorite body of water just getting creative so that we can keep people um um, socializing with each other, hearing about each other, finding some things in common about each other through some of these personal elements that we're bringing to the business to the beginning of our business calls. Um, we've done some things like walking meetings. We know everybody's spending maybe a, a, a lot more time than usual working at home and sitting. Um, we've had people that have taken, you know, their zoom calls out for walks uh, that have been effective. We have virtual happy hours. Uh, we've done that. In some cases, we've just done game hour where we've done Pictionary. It's it's kind of amazing. We did a, a Zoom tri Zoom trivia the other day, and you're able to go out there and on the internet find a program that will just easily pull the pull the um, items up for you and uh, kind of like Jeopardy, and and it does all the work for you. All you do have to click the button. So it's pretty pretty easy to bring some of those things to bear. And the the Pictionary game actually allowed people to learn how to use the whiteboard. Of Zoom, so it was also a little bit of a learning experience to expand their uh, their Zoom capabilities. Um, one of the things that we found very effective on the communi com uh, on the communication level are videos, live videos. So our CEO Bob Selenik has done several. Uh, Emma Buckland, our global president of property management, have, has done multiple live videos where she's just talking at her computer. Um, we've split the group up. Um, we know that our group and essential workers, we're really targeting that group and, and getting information out to them and recognition and communication out to them then let them understand how much we appreciate what they're doing. She's done several, in, several videos that are just directed to our engineering workforce. Um, those have, um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on. Um, our annual awards, we didn't stop those. Um, we, we have annual awards uh, in our market. At the national level, we went on with those via Zoom and they were very effective. Um, so I think it's kind of forced us to think about what, instead of thinking what we can't do now that we're not together, we have to take this great technology that, that, that it's, it's great to have during a time like this and figure out what we can do with it uh, and get creative with it. I had somebody that just had a, a baby on, on my team came back from maternity leave last week and we decided to do a Friday fun day and, and, and did a Zoom meeting where everybody could meet the baby live, which is something that we, you know, people, it could have been months or years because a lot of us work remotely in different cities for us to ever, you know, have gotten a chance to see the baby live. And now you can do those sorts of things. So those are just some ideas that, that things that we've done. And as I said, we're still challenged with this every day. We're, we're in the process of now with school making announcements about um, if they're gonna, gonna if they're gonna go on open in the fall, they're gonna delay the fall school year, or if they're gonna continue to do remote. Um, we have a lot of employees that are concerned about that and how they're gonna continue to balance the uh, the work and family. Uh, when it started last year, I think they thought and everyone thought that you know by the fall we would everything would be back on track, and it's not. So we are um, in the process of figuring out um, how, what kinds of flexibility. Uh, that we can bring additional flexibility that we can bring to the workplace because we know working uh, mothers and fathers have an, an, an additional a time. I think I saw a statistic that said that they were working an additional 65 hours a week on, on just parental duties outside of their work hours. So um, that's, the, that's one of the challenges on, on you know, our, our radar today is to come back with an, an answer, especially where we have groups of people, some that can work for home, from home and be completely effective. And then we have some jobs that can't be done from home. And those are the ones that, that um, we are having to get uh, really creative with on how to uh, continue the flexibility, uh, keep the people and keep them um, actively engaged and working um, every day. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Grayson who's gonna focus on our operational aspect and reentry. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. So one of the things that makes me um, so comfortable that our industry can be resilient in times like this, if you think about, you know, uh, anthrax issues, 9-11, whatever issue we've come up with, the BOMA organization locally, regionally, nationally has really helped connect us instantly. 
while we've been on this call, I'm a member of the Bowman National Advisory Council. We had a, a member ask a question. There's about 50 of us on that group. And so it was easy for that person to ask a question that they were running into a property and quickly get feedback from about 25 or 30 people within the period of time that we've been on the call. So that great connectivity can really help connect us, you know, with our industry. And we're obviously, as BOMA members and allied members, we're thinking about this from the perspective of the owner. Um, if you're, if you've got an occupier uh, view and you've got, you know, that view, it's, it, it may be a little bit different because all the things that we've been trying to do are to keep the buildings open, not put ourselves in a position where we have to go retrade, you know, a deal and, and worry about uh, whether or not someone's going to pay their rent or not. But largely what we've seen is office and industrial has re, uh, rebounded. There's obviously still some softness in the retail side, but there's a lot more recovery uh, that we've seen than we all expected at this point in time based upon gross receipts that we're seeing in our 875 million square foot portfolio. So number one, thank you to all the, the allied members that are on this call that are helping us to um, enable us to keep the tenants uh, working remotely. We've got the buildings open. Uh, while they may not be using the space, they are still got their computers and phone systems and things that are out allowing that to work remotely. I'm also um, just amazed at the simple things are what help get us through these issues. And I'll use two examples, which I just think are, are just great examples. Everybody's focused on social distancing. And the reality is if you don't want to, you're not going to be able to social distance on a plane, in a bus, in a subway, or in an elevator. There's just no way around that. So you're going to have to get used to that, wear a mask when you can't socially distance. And for those buildings that are large enough, tall enough, where you can't walk up the stairs, just simply turning the stairwells one up, one down is a great, simple idea for people who can walk up and down the stairs. The other idea is if you're all worried about, you know, trying to come up with ways to, for, to uh, make sure that the elevator buttons are clean and things like that, a simple box of Kleenex that you can wrap your finger around as you push the button is a great idea. And so it doesn't require these very, very expensive upgrades, you know, this too shall pass. But I think if, as we think about what we are going to have to look at in the future, think about what's happened in the last 10 years in terms of densification of our occupancy. We've gotten tighter and tighter on space. Whoever looked at a, a, a lease outside the healthcare industry that had any scope around cleaning that was a disinfecting scope that was outside um, the restrooms or the coffee bars, hardly any. And so really bringing that focus of disinfection to the workspace and the workstation and ultimately who's going to be responsible for that and who pays for it is a, is a really big question that we're all dealing with right now. While clearly it's outside the building standard scope of current leases, and when deals are renewed and tenants start to ask those things, there may be changes that have to be made to what your property specific building standard is. I think the other thing that we've all learned that's been, that's been really interesting has been that employers are responsible, as Mary mentioned, for determining the fitness of employees. And the lawsuits are stacking up. You can't go out and ask people a lot of questions about their uh, personal health, their cohabitation of the, the people they live with's health. You can't talk to them about their underlying uh, health care, underlying health conditions. And so all those things are between employer and employee. And so that app that Mary talked about is really what we've got to do as an industry is make sure that we're looking and, and making sure we're not involving ourselves in co-employment issues, but making sure that the, the service providers and ourselves and our tenants are all making sure that their own employees are fit for duty and dealing with those issues uh, through that chain of command and not trying to go person to person. That's where the lawsuits are coming from that we're seeing. And that is this, these ideas that you're going to do screening in, in lobbies. It's public. You're in, in potentially embarrassing people. You're inhibiting them from earning an income. And that's where these lawsuits are piling up. So we've got to really as an industry focus on employers being responsible for that, not, uh, not other non-employers. Um, the other thing too, Mary talked a little bit about is that as an, as an industry, we've got to look at our, our um, sick time and how that's treated totally differently. How many of us have drug ourselves into the office when we weren't sick to have a coworker say, hey, what's wrong with you? You really don't look and sound very good today. You're allowed to go home. We can't do that. I mean, we've got denser offices. 
we're dragging ourselves in, you know, so we've really, really got to figure out how we change those sick time um, hours and, and how we're going to use that. Obviously, people want to save that so they can go to Disney World with their kids. Uh, and so we've got to work through the fact that, that we had to get rid of that motivation to, to drag ourselves in in sick. We all have that person in our office that we know who they are. Um, the, the last thing I'm going to touch base on, and then we'll open up for questions, is just how much fun we're all going to have in March of next year doing reconciliations. I mean, this is going to be a blast. Utilities will be down. Elevators will be down in terms of cost. Janitorial for the owner will be down, be up for the tenant. But taxes are going to be off the chart. Think about what's happening to the sales and use and business licensing tax in your communities because of all these businesses being down. It is going to be a huge budget problem for these municipalities. And who's a good target for taxing? Non-voting giant buildings that, quote, have tons of money. So, you know, be looking for uh, issues around uh, the, the taxation issue because these cities, states, and municipalities are going to be absolutely starving for revenue. So um, I'm going to hold it right there and see if there's any questions that come up on the chat, or if anybody wants to ask anything, I'll be happy to field any questions. Thank you, Grayson. Uh, we have one, one question so far. Um, do you anticipate with all this remote working uh, that there'll be an effect on the future of office space? In other words, do you think employers will have more people work from home and require less square footage? In the long run, no. Think about where we were in September 11th. Everybody, you know, pronounced the demise of a high-rise building in any kind of concentrated area. Some uh, companies within New York, you know, diversified their workplace out, at, out away from New York. So I think we have short memories in our industry. Look at how many buildings you see that are being developed right now without any vehicle-borne IED protection. You can drive right through them, you know, uh, and whatnot. So we've really forgotten about Oklahoma City and the Murrah Federal Building bombing. So we have very, very short memories and uh, this, this too will pass. Great. Uh, and for all the participants, if you have a question, please type it into the chat. So um, the next question is uh, kind of along the same lines. Uh, we're seeing trends of shared workspace. Do you think that that will continue in the future or because of things like pandemics that might change? I think in the short run, obviously, shared workspace is, is a challenge. Uh, if you talk to anybody that has, um, has occupied one of those spaces, it depends upon um, that particular theme of that group. So some people had uh, a, a more common area approach, and some had uh, what I would describe as um, more private, quiet space. And so you're seeing a lot of those spaces getting reworked so that you do have more ability to segregate just as you would see in people who have open office concepts that they're having to go in and, and kind of get more social distancing and spacing uh, either by uh, just going every other unit or by changing the furniture configuration and whatnot. So there will be impact short term. Okay, uh, just a few more here from uh, one of our security vendors. She's asking uh, for reconciliations. What do you think about doing, doing for those and for the 2021 budgeting? Yeah, great question. Like I said, it's going to be a blast. Um, you know, so they're, they're going to be, I've always, I always love think, talking about reconciliations because you can really advocate just about any perspective you want. The most consistent is, the most important is to be consistent with the process that your property has been following. So I, I think that the, comp, the conversation gets really complicated when people start saying, well, what we can do is we can just assume that that COVID was a one-year phenomena and not really deal with it and pull all those costs out if there were additional costs. But more importantly, if you're talking to a tenant, the, some of those costs that are saying the base year will be lower because occupancy was lower. And so it's going to be more important for the gross-up calculation to be more accurate based upon a higher occupancy. So I think there's going to be a lot of conversations around people who have established base years and what that reconciliation is for 2020 uh, versus those who are trying to establish a base year for 2020 and then trying to figure out what the base of growth is going to be going off of. It's going to be a fascinating process. So I imagine we're all going to be on a lot of calls talking about that. Great. Uh, we have a few more. I know we're short on time, so I'll try and get through these quickly. Um, real quick, uh, can you share your process for 
uh, what happens on your property when there's a confirmed space, or excuse me, confirmed case? Sure, I think that's one of the most surprising things in this whole process that tenants um, are willing to share with us when there are uh, cases that they have. Um, I know that as, as our allied members have brought up many times before on calls, they need to know as well, because if you're a janitorial company or an engineering company and you're going into a tenant space and you're not aware of that, then you can't prepare your team with the proper PPE. And so obviously I think that that has been something that has been um, fortunate that people haven't gotten real lit litigious about because there's no real obligation of a tenant to inform the management company or the service providers or the other tenants of an issue that they have uh, in their building because that's really not addressed in the lease. So I'm still shocked and surprised we have as much free flowing conversations as we do in the properties about it, but it's been really good for our industry and I hope that that continues and that we don't get too um, litigious about it. Great. Um, how do you handle the balance of employees that have to do homeschool teaching uh, with their children and employees that don't have children? Uh, this questioner says that she's heard that some people don't think it's fair as that, that parents can stay home to homeschool while others have to go into the office. Yeah, Mary, you want to chime in on that one? That's a good question. Yeah, I think that is that is the key challenge now. So we do expect, you know, people to work and to be if they're hourly people to record their time, they may work outside of they may work outside or ask for flexibility to work outside of the eight to five, um, so that they can do um, the school things that they need to do with their children. Um, and it, it's it, and I think that is the biggest challenge that we're trying to deal with right now. How do we do that long term? But um, we are asking people to uh, let us know if they aren't able to carry their workload with an exempt person. You're, you're, you are uh, paying for the job to get done and you should focus on what's not getting done or um, at what's not getting done and focus on tackle it that way. But this is going to be the challenge in the next um, in the next cycle as we try to as we try to even it out, because it certainly is something we will be mindful of when we come up with a a protocol for this because we don't intend for people that don't have children or don't have these challenge to you know pick up the pick up the bulk of the responsibility and lessen the responsibility of others so if we're gonna if they're gonna do less time then there may be less pay associated with it there's a lot of different ways to do it um, and it just depends on how much time the person can spend doing work and if it's not eight hours then we really need to have a discussion about um, how we're going to account for it or what what um, what we're going to change either the person's um, like I said pay their hours um, and and some probably programs like that that people hopefully can elect into um, or job sharing um, that's the other thing that we've kind of tossed about to where we have two people on a property that have the same challenge um, so that they can share the job but again all of those things um, uh, will likely mean uh, uh, less pay for the person because they will work in less hours. And then the next thing you need to be conscious of is the minute in 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 our um, with our um, benefit program. In order to be eligible for benefits and considered full time, you have to work a minimum of 30 hours a week. So we have to just continually to to to, to look at all of those things and factor them in when we're making the decision. And like I said, we don't have the answer for that. Uh, just yet, but we are currently working on it. But those are the things I would consider. Great. Um, what should an employee do if their employer is not following the proper health mandates? I mean, I would say that they need to contact their HR person. I think they try to do something internally. Um, if they can get it resolved there, there's a lot of interpretation around some of these things and maybe it's just they just need an extra information to either understand or maybe the employer's not aware that they're doing it wrong. But because these things are so complicated, the interpretation could be something that just needs to be clarified or um, additional information to understand. But I would, I would go to your internal HR department, a legal person on your team, um, or a next level leader. Uh, that's where I would start. Okay. And uh, this looks like the last question. How are you seeing people reconfigure office spaces for social distancing? Acrylic partitions, moving furniture, what, what sort of things are you seeing? 
furniture relocations or skipping uh, desks over uh, and also uh, alternating schedules. Uh, as we've seen, um, the, the, even when markets have opened, there are people, there are more people than you would think have challenges with um, either childcare, uh, concerns about a current case that may be working within their home that were cohabitants. Um, they could have um, uh, people that live with them or cohabitate with them that have an, a an, um, compromised immune system that don't want to come to work. So what we haven't seen is a lot of challenges where we have a massive amount of people trying to come in. There are more people who are still working through the mechanisms of trying to, um, you know, figure out how they're going to balance the other work challenges, the life challenges they have versus work. Great. Well, thank you again so much. I'm going to throw it back to Amber for our, our writer. Thanks again. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thor, and thanks, Grayson and Mary. That was a really important conversation and really important information for all of us to have right now. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. It was great seeing everyone's face. For those of you that are showing your, your faces, thank you. Um, please stay tuned for details about our next virtual event. Keep a close eye on your email inbox and be sure you're following Boma San Diego on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Our meeting is adjourned and have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye.